What up, y'all? It's your hometown hero, Scott Lane, the Black Bruce Wayne, a.k.a. the real Adam Coleman. So, you riding with True ID. And uh, I'm definitely excited about this guest uh, that we got coming in today. Um, this this show has been a long time coming, man. I've been meaning to do an episode about abortion uh, since forever in the day, and I'm, I'm excited that we're um, actually tackling it, especially given all that's going on in the media right now. Um, my guest today travels throughout the United States and Canada, training pro-life advocates to persuasively defend their views in the public square. You know, he contends that pro-life, uh, the pro-life message rather, can compete in the marketplace of ideas if properly understood and articulated. Uh, a passionate and engaging speaker, uh, this guest is a graduate of UCLA and has a master's in apologetics from Biola University. He's appeared on nationally syndicated Christian programs such as Dr. James Dobson's Focus on the Family, the Albert Moeller radio program, Lee Strobel's Faith Under Fire, and many other programs. Uh, nationally, he's participated in numerous debates at the collegiate level. Uh, his debate impl- opponents have included Nadine Strawson, the president of the UC- of ACLU uh, back in 2008, uh, Catherine Colbert, an attorney uh, who actually argued for abortion rights uh, in the United States Supreme Court case as well. Uh, he's also debated representatives from Planned Parenthood, uh, he's debated or lectured to student groups of uh, over 80 colleges and universities, including Stanford, USC, UCLA, John Hopkins, and just a host of others. And he does regular, regular pro-life advocacy trainings at the high school level as well. He's also the author of The Case for Life, Equipping Christians to Engage the Culture. I'm just really excited uh, uh, to uh, get into this interview. We got a lot to cover. So without further ado, whether or not you endorse the so-called right that ain't right, the choice to abort, I pray this show move your heart to fight for the unborn. That's who we do this for. Let's welcome to the show, Scott Klusendorf. Adam, good to be with you. All right. All right. Glad to have you. Glad to have you. Man, there's so many different, different directions uh, we can go with it, with this conversation. I'm just really excited to, to dig in. But uh, let, let's start with this. Let's. Um, would you mind introducing yourself uh, to our audience in terms of who you are and how you got into pro-life apologetics? Well, the short story is that in 1990, I went to a pro-life gathering where there was a speaker there, an attorney in the Reagan administration, former Reagan administration, that laid out a case for the pro-life view. And I was impressed with the logic of his case. And I thought, you know what? Here's a pro-lifer that doesn't hurt the brain to listen to, because I had heard some pro-lifers who, quite frankly, uh, didn't strike me as all that intelligent. Their arguments tended to be uh, emotion-based. They tended to be kind of out there beyond the scope of what I would consider critical thinking. This guy mm. was not that way. He laid out a case, but then he did something that absolutely changed my life. He showed an eight-minute video depicting abortion. Adam, I had never mm. seen abortion. I had read about it, but had never seen it. And I watched that film And inside, I thought, I'm no different than the priest and the Levite in the parable of the Good Samaritan. They said, probably, that they cared about injustice, but they didn't act like they cared about injustice. They passed by on the other side of the road. And I thought to myself, you know what? You're just like that. And so I went home that day, and I took that VHS tape. VHS tapes, by the way, for your (laughs) listeners, were these rectangular things that we used to, you know, have our kids watch Veggie Tales on. (laughs) Right, Um, right. We, I I showed her that tape, and she said, hey, whatever you think is brewing, I'm with you. And long story short, six months later, I had changed jobs, and I was uh, working full-time, trying to raise money to support myself so I could go train pro-life advocates how to make a case for the pro-life view, and I've been at it almost 30 years now. Wow. Wow. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. Let me, let me ask a question uh, following up to that. So you mentioned that th- this gentleman who made this presentation, he did so on the basis of logic. You know, you he, he, he found it to be compelling yeah. as, a, as a logical argument. Now, um, in contrast to you know what you mentioned about kind of emotion-based arguments and so forth, it yeah. seems to me that 
at least many Christians that I run into feel like that's the only kind of argument that there is to make. Do you think there's just a lack of awareness in terms of the logical case that can be made? Or is it just, you know, what would you say to that? I think Christians, by and large, and there are notable exceptions, but by and large, the general truth is that Christians have not been taught to make a case for life that's persuasive to secular ears. For example, you'll get arguments uh, from Christians that go like this. Well, just think we might be aborting the next doctor who could cure cancer. Or just think we might be aborting a future Mozart who could, uh, you know, bless the world with music. Mm -hmm. These are horrible pro-life arguments. The pro-life argument is not that it's wrong to kill the unborn because we might be aborting a potential Mozart or a potential uh, doctor who cures cancer. Our argument is that it's wrong to intentionally kill an innocent human being. Abortion does that, therefore it's wrong. And it doesn't matter whether we're aborting a gifted person or a, a, a common person. All humans have value, and therefore, for us to make arguments that say what makes abortion wrong is that we might be aborting someone in the future who might make us happy is a terrible pro-life argument. We need to keep the main thing the main thing. The main thing is it's wrong to intentionally kill innocent human beings. Abortion does that. Therefore, it's wrong. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's you know, clear-cut as that. You know, you know, somebody being in your position— um, I mean, obviously, you know, you travel all over the place speaking on this issue. I mean, as I mentioned before, you've done numerous debates. Um, what would you say is the, the current climate in terms of the um, the fight against abortion? Like, how, how are we doing, basically? What's, what's the current state of the fight against abortion? There's good news and bad news. Uh, the good news politically is that since 2016, we've had a more friendly environment to advance pro-life legislation and we shouldn't underestimate just how close we came to getting wiped out in 2016. I mean, think about the run-up to that election. Uh, in California, pro-life crisis pregnancy centers were being forced to refer or advertise for abortion or face crippling fines. Doctors were being told, you must participate in abortion either by referring clients or performing them. Um, this is bad stuff. We were looking at religious liberty and freedom of speech being eroded to a degree we've never seen before. And with the election of Donald Trump and the uh, political climate that followed from that, we saw the abortion juggernaut put on hold. Um, in other words, it was stopped dead in its tracks. What we didn't see as a result of that election, is a major advance of pro-life ideas. And we would be kidding ourselves if we think we're winning the cultural war on the idea front just because we won an election in 2016. Uh, I've told people before you should think of that election as more like Dunkirk than Normandy. We were spared a crushing defeat. We were given space to breathe, but we didn't see a major advance of our ideas, especially when major Christian institutions don't want to touch abortion presentations. They don't want to educate their people. I mean, just look at the major Christian conferences, Adam, that we've got going on. Mm -hmm. Take Urbana. Take Passion. Take any of the big ones. And tell me, when have you ever seen a pro-life presentation at one of those conferences that isn't buried somewhere among other topics. You might see, oh, a social justice uh, uh, presentation. You might see a talk on uh, a vague idea of the sanctity of human life where abortion is just one of many issues, and that's buried in a workshop somewhere deep in the Urbana schedule. <laughs> it's not going to be a... Uh, frontline presentations or presentation, it's going to be hidden if it's presented at all. You look at what we see in churches today. Many of our churches, as a colleague of mine puts it, have become so seeker-friendly, they're believer-worthless. We're not equipping Christians to make the case for life. And that's hurting us. When pro-life presentations are dead on arrival at major Christian conferences and Christian schools and in our churches, the pro-life movement is facing a huge struggle to move our message forward. And that's the, the reality of where we are. On one hand, good news politically, and we may even yet get another Supreme Court justice uh, before it's all said and done. It's good mm -hmm. that we're appointing federal judges. It's good that doctors have been given a little breathing space in terms of exercising their conscience or rights. 
But we shouldn't think that this victory is won, not when millions of Christians who are predisposed to believe our view and do something about it aren't even hearing our message. Mm, mm. That's tough. That's tough. Um, I, man, there's so many questions I think that follow from that. Well, first of all, let me ask, in terms of, of, of that question as to, you know, um, the, the pro-life argument or the pro, pro-life case being presented on the major stage in the in the church, you know, what is the hesitance there? What What is the, what do you think contributes to the church's um, fear of really getting in the mix there? Well, a colleague of mine, Greg Cunningham, puts it well. He says, effective social reformers are seldom liked, and liked social reformers are seldom effective. Mm. So the message that people don't want to hear, and our leaders know this, and the job of a pro-life apologist is to make people want to hear, and we have to persuade them that it's worth their hearing. And that's an uphill battle. But the other issue going on is that millions of people in our churches have participated in abortion. And we're not just talking about women who've had abortion. We're talking about the men who encourage them to abort, uh, the fathers, the, the husbands, the boyfriends, even the moms who may have encouraged a daughter to abort. And these people are all complicit in that decision. And pastors know that if they bring up the issue of abortion, that people are going to end up feeling a great deal of psychic pain. It's painful to admit you sinned on that issue, that you Mm -hmm. participated in the death of an innocent human being. That's not a message a lot of people want to hear. And the mistake that pastors tend to make is they say to themselves, well, I want to spare these people guilt. I don't want to lay a guilt trip on them. And what they don't realize, Adam, is this. When we don't talk about abortion, we're not sparing people guilt. We're sparing them healing because unconfessed sin has them out of full fellowship with their Savior. Uh. And the kind of thing we can do is move them out of their denial of sin and into confessing it so they can find the healing they desperately need. And unfortunately, our pastors are getting this wrong. The other thing they're getting wrong is they think that there's really only one of two choices. Don't talk about abortion, and people will still like you as a pastor, or talk about it and blow your ministry to smithereens. There's actually a third alternative. Hmm. Present a biblical case that is persuasive, hard-hitting, direct, but rooted in the gospel in such a way that you not only communicate the truth of abortion, you communicate the truth of the Christian gospel. It's not either or. It's not a binary choice. We can do both. We can tell the truth about abortion, but do so in a gospel-centered way that brings healing to wounded people. Mm, that's good, man. That's good. Now, I've got uh, I, what I think may be a somewhat of a difficult question. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping, uh, uh, well, I'm hoping I can frame it correctly. Uh, but this is kind of a hot button issue. So I want to talk about just for a second, maybe um, th- this notion or, you know, th- the fact that uh, killing an innocent person is wrong. I mean, obviously, that's something that's uh, it's a necessary truth. I mean, we can go back to the beginning of the Bible with Cain and Abel and see, obviously, you know, that that uh, that murder is, is is wrong. You know, that is a transcendent principle. Right. Uh, but in terms of particularly in, in, in our highly politicized society, uh, there are some moral truths that are um, hashed out in the political arena, right? Um, yeah. And so my concern is that um, when it comes to the matter of abortion, you know, this being a, a life or death issue, right? Um, when it gets tossed into the political arena, it then seems to me that there's all these political entanglements, right? Whereas people feel like, okay, well, I'm a Democrat and therefore on my team, we're supposed to do this. Or I'm a Republican and therefore on my team, we're supposed to do that. And it seems to me that the um, the moral truth of the taking of an innocent life gets diluted by being entangled with these political factions on one side or the other. Is there any way that somebody can engage this issue in a way that's so somewhat disentangled from political factionism, <laughs> I guess is what I'll call it. And so they don't feel like they have to align with one side or the other necessarily to, um, I guess, effectively engage the, 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 uh, the moral issue of abortion. Does that make sense? Yeah, sure. And my answer is in the ideal world, yes. 
in the real world that we live in, no. And let me explain that. Okay. Every moral issue eventually gets politicized. Slavery got politicized. Mm -hmm. Segregation got politicized. Uh, every moral issue of moral consequence that is a dividing line issue in our culture, and certainly abortion would be one, because keep in mind, abortion is not primarily about a surgical procedure. It's about a more fundamental question. Who counts as one of us? And as Abraham Lincoln pointed out, when that's the issue, you're going to have a house divided. You, you can't get around it. It's going to be politicized. Mm -hmm. The fact that an issue becomes politicized is not an excuse to avoid it. The Lord is not going to say to us on Judgment Day, you know, I'm really glad you were silent about racial segregation, and I'm really glad that you were silent about slavery and abortion, because after all, uh, you know, those issues were political, and, and as you know, I'm not a political god. I'm not a Democrat. I'm not a Republican. So you did the right thing by being silent. Boy, uh, the Lord is not going to say that to any of us. Uh, we're going to be asked why we didn't love our neighbor, and we're going to have to give account for that if we were silent on these great moral issues uh, that faced our nation. And so my answer to someone who brings up the political um, question is this. We have to face a hard fact. We may not like the fact, but we got to be honest about what's in front of us. What's in front of us is this. The abortion issue has indeed been politicized at some level. And we need to face a corollary fact. There is one major political party in this country that is dedicated to the proposition that an entire class of human beings can be set aside to be killed and, indeed, can be left to let die should they survive an abortion procedure. And we can't deny that. That is the stated goal of one of our major political parties. Now, to bring balance to this, there's another political party in our nation that... Um, claims to be pro-life, but quite frankly, does a pretty lousy job defending innocent human beings in the womb. Uh, and so here's the choice in front of us. Do we go with a first-class arsonist or a second-class fireman? Uh, there's hmm. no getting around the fact that the two parties are different on this issue and that one of those parties is dedicated to the proposition we can set aside an entire class of humans to be killed. Now, if somebody thinks I'm politicizing the issue by pointing that out, uh, I beg to differ. I'm simply stating the fact of where we are, and I think we ought to be honest and own up to that. What can Christians do if they don't want to be overtly political? Maybe they say, look, I, I don't want to... Does this mean if I'm pro-life, I have to walk around with a, a Donald Trump T-shirt on? No, you don't. <laughs> um, I'm not saying you have to do that at all. But I am going to question you if you tell me you're going to give support to a political party that is hell-bent on killing innocent human beings. And one of our parties is committed to that. And to deny that, I think, is, is simply disingenuous. So what I would say to that Christian is, okay, you don't want to get involved politically? Then you, you need to do this. Number one, start exposing the reality of abortion for what it is. Start with your church. Uh, in your Sunday school class, in your church youth groups, uh, go to our website, caseforlife.com. Uh, download that abortion video we got there, that 55-second uh, uh, abortion video that depicts abortion. Ask for permission to come into your youth group and give a Christ-centered, gospel pointed pro-life apologetics presentation which we can give you pointers on how to do and include that video clip as part of your presentation at least make sure people know what abortion is because what's what tends to happen is uh, as a colleague of mine greg cunningham points out mm -hmm. the pro-life movement has been shouting conclusions rather than establishing facts mm. and i i think cunningham makes a great point when he says listen uh, instead of protesting abortion, expose abortion. When you show abortion pictures, abortion protests itself. So you want to do something that's not political? Fine. Expose abortion for what it is. Make sure people know what it is so that when they do go vote, 
they're well aware of what they're voting and supporting or not supporting. And then the second thing I think Christians can do, they can support their local crisis pregnancy centers. They can make sure that their churches understand a biblical view of human value, that we're valuable not because of things we do functionally, but because of whose image we bear. Those are just a couple of things people can do that don't require signing up to support a political party. Excellent. Excellent, man. And, and you know, it, it's funny because I, I know you were joking about uh, people feeling as, as though if they uh, if they're pro life, that they have to walk around with the Donald Trump. Yeah. Shirt. But I, I think that's actually a real fear. I mean, <laughs> in, in, yeah. in, a, in a strange way, I think that um, just to be perfectly candid, I, can, I always keep it 100 on this show. I think that what you have on on a couple of different levels is individuals who have qualms with the Republican Party and feel that there's sure. either going to be some sort of ethnic or political betrayal by being pro-life. And so therefore yeah. they, they don't come out and just say, well, I'm against because it's almost like, oh, well, you're you're, you're kind of trading on your on your group, so to speak, you know, and I think I think that's a very real thing, which is why I was, I'm glad that you touched on, uh, I guess you could say nonpartisan ways to influence the culture. And actually, this this next question is not um it's, it's not on my my um, my list here, but I want to go ahead and ask it anyway. Because I think that you, you kind of touched on it for a second. I mean, kind sure. of toss around ideas about ways in which the church is called to impact society. Right. And yeah. I think that. It seems to me that you have this this element of the church being, at least in having the, having the capacity to get involved in, in civics in a, in a non political way, like building civic institutions that can, in a sense, cultivate culture, right? But it seems to me that if the church is not doing what it's supposed to do in terms of cultivating uh, right culture, then we end up on the back end, you know, putting all of our faith in politics to try to regulate culture, you know, and it's not to say that there has to be a clean cut black or white either or, but I think that what you spoke to a second ago about, you know, getting in your church and, and educating people, um, actually even, even your, your institute, you know, tra- training folks. I mean, it seems to me that that's kind of the, the aspect that maybe the church hasn't engaged in in terms of just really getting our ideas out there and cultivating culture as opposed to, you know, pulling all of our faith and trying to regulate culture on the back end. What, what do you think about that? Well, I think it's both and. Okay. Um, you were right to say it's not either or. And, and the reason I say it's both and is politics is downstream from culture. That mm-hmm. is true. But culture is influenced by politics. That also is true. So let me give you uh, some examples. If you look, for example, at the way politics can impact culture, go back to the civil rights legislation of 1964. Prior to the passage of that legislation, a majority of Southerners supported segregation. And this was brought out in in not just one poll, but in many. Within two years of the passage of the Civil Rights Act in 1964, a majority of Southerners supported the Civil Rights Act. In other words, law impacted culture. And this is an idea that goes all the way back to Aristotelian thinking, the idea that law is a moral teacher, that when you enshrine something in law, it is much more than just putting a statute on the books. You are literally informing minds. You are informing how the society organizes itself, not only in its action, but in its moral thinking. the, uh, The reverse is also true, that there are times when it's culture that that changes the law. And a a classic example of that would be William Wilberforce working for decades to outlaw the slave uh, trade in the UK. And after his efforts at educating the public, uh, he was able to uh, get it outlawed. and, And finally, Parliament came along. So it works both ways. We don't have to choose as Christians which one is the right one, and we forget the one we reject. We can do both of those things. In fact, I love that line in the movie Amazing Grace about the life of William Wilberforce, where one of the uh, anti-slavery crusaders says to William Wilberforce, as he poses the question, should I pursue God or should I uh, pursue slave or abolishing the slave trade, She looks at him and says, sir, with all due respect, have you ever considered that maybe you could do both? And Mm. I think that's what we as Christians need to look at. 
our Christian worldview should not be bifurcated. It should not be that we have this Christian worldview that informs our morals, it informs our spiritual life, but it has nothing to do with our politics. That's something separate over there. We just kind of box out and, uh, you know, kind of avoid like uh, a bad-tempered cousin you might have. You know what I mean? (laughs) No, our Christian worldview is supposed to inform all of what we do. And when somebody tells me they have no problem wholeheartedly supporting a party that promotes infanticide, I think that's a defect in their Christian worldview. Now, that doesn't mean they have to go vote Republican in the next election. That's not what I'm saying. I am saying, though, when you give full throttle support to a party that says we can set aside an entire class of human beings to be intentionally killed, something is wrong in your Christian worldview if you think that's okay. Um, And I... I think we shouldn't bifurcate. We shouldn't say, hey, my Christianity is over here, but politics is this thing over here that's different. No, our Christian worldview should impact and influence everything we do, including what we do at the ballot box. That's excellent, man. That's excellent. Now, I want to get into the, the actual pro-life argument, but if you don't mind, I have one more question. I think that yeah. has to deal with, with politics. And it just it, it came up based upon. Oh, man, um, you're fine. I OK, like great. <laughs> up the edgy issues that that you're, you know what? This is all very good, Adam. Excellent. Because, uh, the worst thing you can do when you do a podcast is to play it safe. And I really like the fact you don't. Oh no! Well, it, it might be to my own detriment at times, but you know, we'll, 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 we'll find out when this episode airs. There you go. But, uh, so I, I want to ask you a quick question about uh, the doctrine or, or principle of subsidiarity. You know, um, so f- for my listeners who don't know what that is, I probably can't explain it nearly as well as as you can, uh, Mr. Klusendorf. But it generally has to do with where the government gets involved in public affairs or you know affairs maybe at the local level, right? Um, it's kind of like a sloppy way of of, of uh, maybe explaining it. But, you know, the notion is that government shouldn't stick its nose in where it's not needed. I guess maybe that's the way we can put it. Right. And so I'm wondering about um, what element does, um, I guess, holding government accountable to functioning the way that a government ought to function um, how does that play into the ad- abortion debate? So when I think about, for example, you know, Roe versus Wade, you know, you have this this federal this decision at the federal level that then dictates what happens, you know, all the way on down, obviously, you know, the state level and so forth. You know, and it seems to me and, and I'm not a, a, a scholar on Constitution on, on the Constitution, but it seems to have been a judicial overreach you know, in some regards. Like, you know, what responsibility do you think we have aside from the, the immediate discussion on whether or not the abor- the abortion is right or wrong, um, what role do you think we have to play in terms of holding the government accountable to function properly? And, and maybe how does that intersect with, with the abortion dis- discussion? Well, I like the way you frame that because you're precisely correct. The church does have a role to hold the government to moral account. And I love the way that Chuck Colson brings this out in his book, Kingdoms in Conflict, Uh, And he was really the first evangelical to popularize that notion, which I think is thoroughly biblical. If the church does not hold government to moral account, who will? Um, Now, that doesn't mean that church and government don't have different roles. They do. However, it is the church that shines the light on government policy and evaluates it in terms of a biblical worldview and holds government to moral account, especially on those issues where we're talking about injustice being perpetrated on uh, innocent human beings. We want to make sure that innocent human beings are protected and given the dignity that they bear as being creatures who bear the image of their maker. That That's number one priority. But I also think that you made a very good point a moment ago when you pointed out that the court overreached on Roe. I'm always puzzled when people tell me, I support Roe v. Wade, they say, because I don't want the federal government involved in abortion. Mm. And of course, I have no idea what they're talking about. In Roe v. Wade and Doe v. Bolton, one branch of the federal government, the courts, told the other two legislative Uh, the legislative and the executive branches, the other two branches, you have no say in this. We will alone determine what policy will be. And therefore, they took 
the voters and the elected representatives of the people out of the abortion decision altogether and left it only to the court. That's government being very involved in the abortion decision when you have one branch of the federal government telling everybody else what they can and can't do on the issue. So when people tell me they don't want government involved, that's why they support Roe v. Wade, my first question is, does that include the federal courts? Because they are very much involved. The second thing is that as Christians, we will care about the inter, um, how do I put this? We will care, care about the interface between law and biblical theology in this sense. While we don't as Christians require that the government get involved in every moral issue, for example, do we want to make it a federal crime to uh, tell a lie. Well, uh, of course, that's going to depend on what you're lying about, and if you're lying to a grand jury, you're going to be in trouble, of course. Right. But do we want to make every sin a, a, a uh, legal infraction? Well, no, of course, you can't realistically do that. But when there is a moral issue about who counts as one of us, and whether it's okay to intentionally kill innocent human beings in the womb, that is not a private area of life. That is a public area. It has to do with we as a people. Mm. What kind of people are we who counts as one of us? And that is not something you can relegate to the private sphere the way you might, um, hey, uh, whether or not your kids go to church or not. These are things that we have to deal with publicly. And if an innocent human being is being killed in abortion, intentionally being killed, then that is a natural rights issue. And it goes back to our Declaration of Independence, where our founders laid it out that the reason human beings have uh, special status to them is that they are endowed by their creator with certain rights. And, of course, we know that the right to life is one of those. Now, natural rights, as many of your listeners may or may not know, are different from legal rights. Natural rights are those rights you have simply because you're a human being. Mm -hmm. For example, if you visit the city of London in the U.K. next year, do you have a right not to be gunned down in the street even though you're not a British citizen? And, of course, the answer is yes. Now, you don't have a right to vote in the next British election because you're not a citizen of that nation. But you certainly have a natural right in virtue of your humanity not to be unjustly killed. And that natural right does not vary from place to place. You have it simply because you're a human being. The pro-life argument is not that the unborn deserve legal rights because they've achieved a certain age or development, and therefore are entitled to a right to life the way we give people a right to driver's licenses. No, what we're saying is they have a right to life that is natural, meaning it stems from their humanity, and they have this right to life simply because they're human, regardless of their size, their level of development, their environment, or degree of dependency. And because they have a natural right to life, government has a responsibility to recognize that right and protect the unborn. That's our basic argument. And that cannot be a private thing. That is an area where the church should be holding the government to moral account to protect the natural rights of all citizens. Excellent. Excellent, man. Now, along that score, man, I definitely want to get into the, um, the actual pro-life position and how we can sure. uh, advocate for it. So would you mind kind of walking us through uh, the pro-life argument? And I know you've got different techniques and things like try out the toddler, you know, what, you know, answering the question, was the unborn sled? Well, could you kind of just take us from you know A to Z? I mean, I understand you can't, <laughs> we've only got about 30 minutes left here, so you can't give a full blown presentation sure. here. But would you mind kind of taking us through those steps so that we can kind of, you know, get our, cut our teeth a little bit on this uh, pro-life argument? Sure. In fact, Adam, by the time we're done here, uh, all of your listeners are going to know how to uh, defend the pro-life view in a minute or less. Excellent. Uh, you know, if they want to do something that's not political, here's what they can do. They can make sure they understand the pro-life argument and they're prepared to convey it to somebody in a minute or less. Uh, mm. That doesn't require you to register as a Democrat or a Republican or an independent. That just requires you to take the issue seriously. So here is the pro-life argument that, that I'll put forward in a syllogism and then we'll defend it with science and philosophy. 
The syllogism, which, by the way, don't let that big word throw uh, you, it simply means premise, premise, conclusion. And we use syllogisms all the time. I don't know about you, but I had them used mm -hmm. against me when I was in high school. You know, I'd say, Dad, can I use the car Friday night? Dad would say, no. Uh, well, why not? Well, because we told you that your driving privileges were predicated upon you getting good grades. You are not getting good grades, therefore you will not drive. That's a syllogism. <laughs> right. uh, not, and in that case, not one that worked in my favor. <laughs> Did your dad know my dad? Because that sounds real familiar. That's, yeah, uh... <laughs> it was, sounds real familiar. Probably sounds familiar to a lot of our listeners. Um, yeah. And they're not alone in that sense. And there is hope. As, a, as I got into college, I got better. And, uh, but at high school, I wasn't exactly a model student. The pro-life syllogism goes like this. Premise one, it's wrong to intentionally kill innocent human beings. Premise two, abortion intentionally kills an innocent human being. Conclusion, therefore abortion is wrong. It's wrong to intentionally kill innocent human beings. Abortion does that, therefore it's wrong. Now, pro-lifers do not defend that syllogism by merely pointing to their faith or pointing to the Bible. We actually defend it with science and philosophy. We argue from science that the unborn are distinct, living, and whole human beings. They are distinct in that they are not part of the mother. The unborn may have its own blood type, uh, a gender different from the mother. Uh, it will have a different uh, genetic makeup from the parents. In other words, it resides in the mother, but it's not part of the mother. The unborn are living because dead, dead things don't grow. Uh, and then we say they're whole human beings, distinct living and whole human beings, because the type of thing the unborn is does not change even though it has yet to grow and mature. Human parents produce human offspring. And by the way, anybody who doubts that, my question is simply this. How do two human parents create offspring that isn't human but later become so? Mm. And that's a tough question uh, to quote. The infamous, famous philosopher, Ricky Ricardo, they've got some explaining to do at that point. <laughs> right, right. Um, philosophically, we argue that there's no essential difference between the unborn embryo you were and the adult you are today that would justify killing you at that earlier stage of development. And we point to the four differences people typically bring up to disqualify the unborn. They say, well, the unborn are too small. Uh, why you look at that embryo, you can't even see it. It's the size of a dot at the end of a sentence. You'd need a microscope to see it. Mm -hmm. uh, they say the unborn are, are not developed enough, that their level of development does not warrant protecting them in the, in the womb. Uh, you also hear that they're in the wrong environment, meaning location. They're in the womb, and until they're out, they have no rights. And then you hear that the unborn don't count because their degree of dependency is too much. They depend on the mother, and until you can live independent of another human being, you don't have a right to life. Each of those objections is deeply flawed. I mean, take size. You can, by the way, remember these objections by thinking of the acronym SLED, S-L-E-D. Mm -hmm. uh, size. Uh, yeah, of course the embryo is smaller than the adult he will one day become. But here's the question Christians need to ask. Why does body size matter? It's not enough for someone to just make an assertion that the unborn is small. Uh, so what? Uh, how does body size determine my value? They've got to argue for that. Do we really think that large humans are more valuable than small people? Do we think Shaquille O'Neal, the former seven foot two basketball star that spent most of his career with the Los Angeles Lakers before committing treason and playing a year with the Boston Celtics, do we think <laughs> that uh, somehow he's more human and valuable than us because he's bigger? Body size doesn't give you value. What about level of development? Okay, you were less developed as an embryo. My answer, so? Why does body development determine value? Two-year-olds are less developed than 21-year-olds. We don't think the two-year-old has less of a right to life. And by the way, development doesn't end when you're born. It continues for years. Um, environment, there's your E in that acronym, size, level of development. What about environment, where you're located? And, of course, where you are has no bearing on who you are. Uh, how does a journey 
of seven inches down the birth canal suddenly transform you from non-human, non-valuable thing we can kill to valuable human being we can't? And the answer, of course, is if you weren't already human and valuable, changing your address doesn't get you there. And then finally, degree of dependency. Yes, you depended on your mother for survival. But since when does dependency on another human being mean that we can kill you? Um, I, I happen to live in a part of Atlanta, outside Atlanta, uh, that is famous for the location where they film the wildly popular television series, The Walking Dead. I don't know how many of your listeners watch that show, but it's a zombie show. And uh, by the way, just anybody should listen up before you go watch it. Be advised. It's very graphic. But it's a story about a zombie virus that breaks out. Uh, it's not a demonic virus. It's a, it's a virus. And uh, basically, if you get bitten by a zombie, you uh, die, and then your body gets reanimated as a zombie and comes back, and you too go around biting people, and that's how the disease gets spread, or the virus gets spread. The hero of the show is a, a, a character named Rick Grimes, a sheriff. And in season one, he's in a gunfight with bad guys, and he gets hit with... Uh, a shot. He's in the hospital for a month in a coma, and while he's in the hospital for a month in that coma, the zombie apocalypse breaks out. And somehow uh, he's left alone, all alone in that hospital. The zombies come through, but they miss him. And uh, he wakes up and has to figure out what happened to the world I once knew, what happened to my wife and son, and that's essentially season one of The Walking Dead. Well, let's mm -hmm. change that script, Adam. Suppose one doctor stayed behind to care for Rick, and Rick depends totally on him for survival. Would it be okay for that doctor to slit Rick's throat because Rick depends totally on him for survival? Size, level mm. of development, mm. environment, degree of dependency, none of those are good reasons for saying we could kill you as an embryo, but not now. Mm -hmm. So let's defend that in a minute or less. Uh, I'm going to guess that some of your listeners have people come to their homes on the in the holiday seasons uh, season Thanksgiving Christmas uh, New Year's and those visitors whether they're family members or friends are not Christians they do not hold a pro-life view and suppose that you have an Aunt Betty who comes to visit you from Boston and she is not a Christian she's not pro-life and you're eating your Thanksgiving dinner and she looks at you between bites of turkey and says now why are you pro-life here is your answer in a minute or less and you're going to note something very interesting about the answer. We're not going to cite Bible verses, but we will convey biblical truth. Here is your answer in one minute or less. Aunt Betty, I'm pro-life because the science of embryology says that from the earliest stages of development, you were a distinct, living, and whole human being. You weren't part of another human being, like skin cells on the back of my hand. You were already a whole living member of the human family, even though you had yet to grow and mature. And you know what else, Aunt Betty? There's no essential difference between that embryo you were and the adult you are today that would justify killing you back then. Differences of size, level of development, environment, and degree of dependency are not good reasons for saying you could be killed then but not now. Now, I think I got that done in under a minute. Yeah, absolutely. I was, I was looking at the time. You certainly did. Yeah. yeah. Now, notice, um, I didn't cite Bible, but I conveyed biblical truth. Another thing, notice this. I actually made an argument. I gave Aunt Betty something to think about. I did what my colleague Greg Kokel says. I put a pebble in her shoe that's going to wear on her and wear on her until she deals with it. And that's the good news. As Christians, we don't have to give a case where we close the deal on the spot. Very few people we talk to are going to slap themselves on the knee and say, I'm really glad the Lord put you in my life to straighten out my twisted thinking. I mean, that's not what's going to happen. <laughs> right, right. Rather, you're going to give them something to ponder that will wear on them, and over time, we hope that uh, they will change their mind. But we don't need to become discouraged when people don't change their mind on the spot. Wow. Excellent, man. Excellent. Yeah, you, you really knocked that out in, in about 10, 15 minutes, man. <laughs> I'm impressed. I'm impressed. That's pretty good. You know, actually, I want to take a step back because you, know, you went through the sled argument. I, actually, I've got yeah. to give credit to uh, a friend of mine. Shout out to my man, uh, Don Carey, uh, who, who's probably checking out this show. Um, so so going back to the E in, in sled, I think it was it was environment. And actually, he yeah. made a very interesting argument. He's, he was talking about how, you know, say during the the. Uh, the slavery era, you know, the antebellum, antebellum South era, um, 
you had prior to the the Fugitive Slave Law Act. Right. If uh, yeah. if a slave were to cross over, I guess it was the Mason Dixon line or I got to get my history right. But yeah. whatever that line was, then they could be considered free, you know, prior to the yeah. Fugitive Slave Law Act. And he says there's an interesting parallel between this notion of like crossing a line and all of a sudden having all of your personhood, you know, respected, you know, and in the same sort of a way, it's like, you know, people are saying, well, once the baby is out of the birth canal, you know, just that eight inches or so from out of birth. And now they've crossed over into full personhood. And it's so arbitrary. It's not even funny. You know, the slave was a person yeah. prior to their, you know, changing their geographical location. And in the same way you have, um, you know, uh, the unborn, they are indeed human beings even prior to, you know, leave, exiting the birth canal. That is an excellent example. Uh, a parallel one to it would be this. Um, what would we think of fetal surgery? Uh, in this case, we have situations now, and there was a, a highly publicized case last month involving a young woman in Great Britain. She was pregnant with a child who was suffering and needed surgery. They removed the child from her womb, fixed the problem, and put the child back to be born normally at 39 weeks. Mm. So did that child go from being a non-person we can kill to briefly being a person while we were doing the surgery back to being a non-person once we put the child back in the womb, clearly where you're at does not determine the kind of thing you are. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, now, you know, actually earlier, I want to go back to something you, you said. Um, well, we kind of talked about how this issue gets entangled, you know, or the matter of whether or not, you know, taking the innocent life is, is uh, wrong or not. That gets entangled with, with other things. And I think in terms of the kind of objections I get, it happens in a, a different way than strictly politics as well. I kind of want to throw something at you. Yeah. So, you know, when people raise the issue of, of poverty, as in, you know, women not having access to care without Planned Parenthood or, you know, what about low income families and women who, you know, miss opportunities for, you know, the better of their lives, you know, things along those lines. I mean, obviously that's a separate question as, you know, concerning, you know, whether or not taking a life is right or wrong, but that, that seems to be a pretty popular one. How do you come back on that? Well, notice that that argument assumes the unborn are not human. Does anybody suggest we kill two year olds so that people will have enough to eat? No, they only suggest killing the unborn, which means they're assuming something about the unborn. They're not assuming about the toddler, namely that the unborn are not human like that two-year-old. And what we need to do as pro-lifers is not let that assumption go unchallenged. Nobody suggests that we can kill teenagers to make economic problems go away. Although some of your listeners might be thinking, wait a minute, that sounds like a viable option. <laughs> but <laughs> right. the reality is we don't kill teenagers or toddlers to make difficult life problems go away. The only candidates for that are the unborn, which means people are assuming they're not human. By the to make it uh, easier to preserve scarce resources, we are worried about people eating too much. We ought to kill single adult men because they eat more than anybody else. Why even kill unborn humans that aren't even eating yet? <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. So it, it's a silly uh, objection to begin with. But the principal problem is that we're assuming the unborn are not human, and they haven't argued for that. They're simply assuming it, and we need to call them out on it. Okay, they may be right. Maybe the unborn aren't human, but you're going to have to give me a syllogism for that. You're going to have to give me evidence and argue for it. I'm not going to let you get away with just assuming it. I mean, imagine if I said to you, Adam, hey, Adam, uh, when did you stop cheating on your taxes? You'd say, well, mm. excuse me? Uh, wait a minute. Uh, I don't cheat on my taxes. Well, that's not what I asked you. I asked you, when did you stop? You would rightly point out that I was assuming something I had not proven, namely that you were cheating on your taxes. I didn't give you any evidence you were cheating. I didn't present a case to show that you were cheating. I simply assumed it. And this is what people do on abortion. They simply assume the unborn are human. They don't argue for it. And one tactic I found quite effective for exposing this mm -hmm. is the tactic you mentioned earlier, trot out the toddler. And the way this works is whenever you hear an argument for abortion, uh, whenever you're talking to a neighbor or a fellow student, a coworker, and they bring out a reason why abortion ought to be allowed, 
ask yourself, would this work as a good argument for killing a toddler? Now, you're not going to argue that killing the toddler and killing the unborn are morally equivalent. That's not what you're doing with this tactic. Mm -hmm. You're simply showing that the issue is not poverty. It's not trusting women. It's not privacy. It's none of those things. It's what is the unborn. So here's how it would work. Suppose somebody said to me, why don't you trust women to make your own personal decisions? The first words out of my mouth would be, pretend I have a two-year-old and I would hold my hand out at knee-high just to help them visualize it. Pretend I have a two-year-old in front of me. His parents want to rough him up in the privacy of the bedroom, and they want us to trust them to make their own personal decisions about doing that. Should we allow them to do that in the name of trusting them to make their own personal decisions? And, of course, the answer will be, no, you can't do that. And my answer is, well, why not? Well, because he's a human being. Ah, if the unborn are human, like that toddler, mm -hmm. should we kill the unborn in the name of trusting people to make their own personal decisions? Well, that's different. The unborn aren't human. The toddler is. Ah, you may be right, but you're going to have to argue for that. You can't simply assume the unborn aren't human. You're going to have to argue that they're not human. So the real issue that separates us is not that you're pro-choice and I'm anti-choice or that you trust women and I don't or you're for privacy and I'm not. The real issue is you don't believe the unborn are human. I do. Let's discuss that issue. That's the real issue. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Good stuff, man. Good stuff. So let me ask you this. Um, I'm actually... Um, I have the opportunity because we've kind of mostly been dealing with how do we engage kind of maybe your average person on the street, per, uh, yeah. possibly. But I actually have an opportunity. Um, you know, obviously, I, like I mentioned to you before uh, we started our interview, I live in Virginia, and, and recently we've had that uh, just horrendous bill proposed by uh, Kathy Tran and, and and others, you know, in regard to you know late term abortions and, and so yeah. forth. Um, and, you know, so actually I contacted, uh, you know, my, my legislator, you know, and we're actually in the process of, of scheduling a, a date and time for me to go and, you know, speak with her. And I want to present uh, the pro-life case. You know, I don't know what may come of it, but I at least want to, you know, give it a shot. You know, what would you say yeah. to somebody like myself, you know, who's just trying to, you know, get in to this sort of a thing on the local level and maybe has an opportunity like that to to influence maybe a politician? It, you know, I'm assuming that they look at things through a slightly different lens. Like what, what might be some points that, that one might want to touch on in that regard? Well, what I say to anybody that wants to influence government, uh, whether you're trying to make your case to Ralph Northam or whoever, um, mm. I would say this. When you're in politics, the best thing you can say is that you oppose abortion because it's wrong to intentionally kill innocent human beings and stop right there. Keep coming back to that. Don't let them change the topic on you. I oppose abortion because it intentionally kills an innocent human being. And that is wrong. Uh, and you just stick with what abortion is, the intentional killing of an innocent human being. Because all the critics want to talk about choice, privacy, trusting women, why you hate poor people, uh, why you want to take uh, medical benefits away from people who need them uh, at Planned Parenthood, yada, yada, yada. And it's all an attempt to change the subject. And what you want to do is keep the main thing the main thing. Abortion is wrong because it intentionally kills an innocent human being. And if people go to our website at uh, ProLifeTraining.com, we have a section of our website uh, under the resource section called The Case for Life, and they can read up there on how to keep the main thing the main thing. There's a case there that they can scroll through on making their case that, again, at ProLifeTraining.com and just go to the resources tab and, and the up will pop the case for life option. And they can literally read through how to keep the main thing the main thing. But what you want to do is keep bringing, bringing it back to the point that abortion is wrong because it intentionally kills an innocent human being. And you want to build your remarks solely around that. Excellent, man. Excellent. Well, hey, man, this has been a phenomenal interview. We covered a lot of ground. I, I, I certainly appreciate you coming on. Uh, if you would mind, as we kind of close out here, just kind of share with folks how they can get in contact with you, you know, per, uh, to have you come and speak or engage your material and, and whatnot. How can, how can folks access what you're doing? Well, they can reach me at ProLifeTraining.com. There's a, a contact uh, uh, option there, and that email will get sent over to me. Uh, I will see it. 
So that's one way. Uh, again, ProLifeTraining.com, and they can keep track of our speakers who are out speaking in Catholic and Protestant high schools and Christian worldview forums and chapels at Christian universities. Uh, we've got five speakers, and last year we reached 72,000 students with pro-life apologetics training, wow. and that's what we do. That's our focus. We focus on conveying the moral logic of the pro-life view. And all of our speakers do that. Uh, we're a little different than other pro-life groups. We don't go out and do abstinence talks or chastity talks. We support groups who do, but that's not what we do. We teach why the pro-life position is true and reasonable to believe, and we give people reasons for accepting it. Excellent, man. Excellent. Well, hey, well, once again, I want to thank you for coming on. And for my listeners out there, I love y'all. Uh, you can definitely follow us on, on Facebook. Uh, our YouTube channel, check us out on um, on iTunes, give us five stars, comment and all that sort of a thing. And certainly go check out uh, Scott Klusendorf in terms of what he's got going on. He's doing some great work. And as always, I love you guys. And that's another episode of the books. Peace. <laughs>